Okay. Um, a few things up front. If at any stage I start to speak too quickly, do that. Yeah? I am Welsh, not English. Um, this is important to understand. Yeah? <laughs> now you know it, to call me English is a deadly insult. Right? <laughs> My children will seek out your children unto the seventh generation and so on. But you also need to understand that in Welsh, the first letter of every noun changes according to the word that comes before it. So if you say Wales, it's Cymru, which begins with a C. If you say the Welsh, it becomes a Gymru, the C changes to a G. Now that may sound like it's complex to learn, actually it isn't. You just speak it very quickly <laughs> and it happens naturally. <laughs> but we do tend to do the same thing with English, so feel free to slow me down a bit as we go. The other thing, and it's well summarised by this slide from Hugh, is my role to some extent is to be a constructive irritant. There's a wonderful English word for this which I'm proud of, which is curmudgeon. And if you want to look at that, feel free. Yeah? I reserve the right to be more reasonable if you ask me a question, but I will push some things a little bit to an extreme just to make a point. Because the danger is if you hear something with familiar language, you may associate it with something which it isn't. Yeah? And we got an awful lot of that in complexity theory at the moment. We got people picking up the language and just applying it to the same old methods they've used for the last 10 years. And that's actually damaging the whole idea behind it. It's a way of thinking differently. This is also definitely within the tradition of what's called sense making. That's Vike, Dervin, myself, and others. And sense-making is defined as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. Now that carries out two key concepts. One is we have to make sense. That means we have to think about it. We have to understand why things happen. But we also have to act in the world. We have to do things. Now the trouble is either extreme is bad. There are too many people in the Agile movement who say, well, if it works, just carry on. And they don't understand why it works. And that's fine until the context shifts or they want to scale it or apply it somewhere else and then it breaks down. If you don't understand why, you can't adapt. And what you're effectively doing is of using recipe books. And far too many people, and I've seen a whole bunch of agile methods and training courses which just have recipes. You know, do these three things, do these five things and life will be wonderful. Now, there's nothing wrong with recipe books as long as you've got the right kitchen and you've got all the right ingredients. But if any of those aren't present, the recipe book user is dead. And at that point, you need a chef. This is a famous Welsh chef. He's created two Michelin three-star restaurants. He served an apprenticeship. That means his fingers know how to do things without his brain having to be consciously engaged. This is actually a key aspect of programming. I remember when I programmed, the best programs I wrote are when I just went into the haze for three hours and you just did things. Because actually consciousness is a distributed function. It's not co-located with the brain. It's also extended into the nervous system, the hormonal system, and even things like pheromone traces, which we can pick up from kilometers, actually impact our actual impressions of things like trust. So start to realize the brain and the body are far more complex and far more interwoven than we think. So there's a whole body of knowledge which it takes two to three years for the brain to assimilate so you can do it. And if you don't know the theory on that, look at London taxi drivers, the two years it takes them to acquire what's called the knowledge. The hippocampus is changed by that process, physically changed. Yeah? So apprenticeship is key, serving your time is key for a whole body of human knowledge. But also, the chef understands the theory of taste. So if an ingredient is missing, they can substitute, or they can choose not to use that ingredient to do something else. And it's that combination of theory and practice which makes them successful. So just emphasizing theory or just emphasizing practice are actually quite dangerous. We need the two together, and the word for that is praxis. And as we used to say in the 70s, praxis makes perfect, which is a nice play on words. Oh, and by the way, putting the recipe book online doesn't make any difference. <laughs>
it's still a recipe book. So what I want to do is to start off with three core concepts. I'm then going to move into the Kinevian framework and particularly focus on a domain model of actual the complex system itself. Now just to check, how many people would say they know what complexity theory is about? I'm not going to test this. You can put your hand up without fear of being questioned, all right? Unless your name's Jürgen, in which case you will get questioned. No, it's okay, right? Okay, how many people have come across the Kinevian framework? That's interesting, more on the latter than the former, and we're seeing a lot of that. Okay, I'm probably going to do some 101 complexity stuff then to bring everybody up to date. Okay, so that's the plan. Then I want to finish off with the work we're doing on micro-narrative, particularly the new work on user requirements capture and the interaction between continuous mass field capture of micro-narratives and things like object libraries and project management. Right? So that will kind of like come into deep modern practice, but it will be state of the art. So that's the plan. So there are three concepts. First one, a key issue, and the word it comes from evolutionary biology, it's called acceptation. And that picture is an example of it. It's from the floods in Bangkok a few years ago. I've done some work on those. You know the floods are coming three or four days before they arrive, yeah, because the headwaters are coming. And one of these guys, he's got a nice new BMW or a Honda, I can't read the sign on this, and he doesn't want his car to be destroyed by the floods. And by sheer luck, he'd had a large piece of furniture delivered that day. So he drove his car into the plastic bag and sealed the end, and the car survived the flood. Now that is called acceptation. It's taking something designed for one purpose and using it for something else which has a completely different utility. It's a pity New Yorkers didn't read about this case before the last hurricane because they might have had a little less damage. In actual fact, now in Bangkok, every garage has a specially made plastic bag because it's created a whole industry. And if you want other examples, think about the Marconi engineer maintaining a radar machine in 1947 who noticed a chocolate bar melted in their pocket. And from that we get microwave ovens. Apple are masters of acceptation. If you actually look, Apple actually don't invent much. They find completely new uses for things that other people have invented for other purposes. Acceptation is a far more successful strategy for innovation than adaptation. And we see the same thing in nature. If you look at evolutionary biology, exception produces step changes in evolutionary progress, whereas adaption produces slow change. Yeah? So one of the things we should be trying to do within the software community is to create exceptive moments, i.e. ways in which software interacting with human beings, and that interaction is key, creates novel or unexpected uses for existing capabilities. Right? And that's one of the ways that we can become strategic as developers. It also means the architecture of what we do has to be designed to enable acceptation, which means you need good scaffolding, you need finely grained objects, you don't have big chunky things, you have smaller things, and you need to allow them to interact within network structures fairly freely. We also, and I think this may or may not upset people, we need to stop thinking about software development as a manufacturing process. That's a linear concept. We need to start to think about software development as a service-based provision, an evolutionary process. And far too many of the agile, lean family of methods borrow too much from manufacturing and create linear processes without real adaptive capacity. Taking a linear process and drawing it as a circle doesn't make it non-linear. <laughs> Taking a linear process and doing it faster doesn't make it non-linear. Right? Non-linearity requires parallelism and a completely different approach, and that's what I want to introduce. So that's one key word. The other word is coherence, a key word in corporate strategy these days. Coherence is a halfway house between we know it's true and it's anybody's guess. Yeah? So my metaphor for that, if you want, is a spider's web early in the morning. You can see the pattern. It's still coherent, but it's no longer perfect. And the reality is most of the time we have to make decisions based on evidence which is coherent but not absolute. 
Now that's an important concept because it also allows us to say what isn't coherent. And if you don't know it, there's a whole mathematics now behind coherence mapping, work of Thagard and others on this. Yeah, it's a whole new concept of proof. It's also key on user requirements. If I have coherence, I experiment, I prototype. If I don't have coherence, I don't. And I'm going to come back in a minute and argue that scrums start too late in the development cycle. By the time a sprint starts, the requirement is too defined. And the whole scrum process takes too much emphasis on a user knowing what they want before the process starts. Yeah, so I want to come back to that in a minute. That will be a key aspect of what I'm talking about. The other way of illustrating coherence is to say that evolutionary theory is coherent. We know it's not right, but it's coherent. Whereas on the other hand, creationism requires a level of construction of theory which goes beyond any reasonable limits. And I love that cartoon. You know, it's a perfectly valid theory, but it's incoherent in terms of what would happen. Although it does combine creationism and guns, which is probably a sort of appropriate metaphor uh, for where that comes from. The third concept, so you know, to hold those two in mind. With that, I might have put up another one, which is called coevolution. As one thing interacts with another thing, patterns form from the interaction. And once a pattern is formed, you can't go backwards. Right? Uh, anybody got teenage children? Right, you know about coevolution. <laughs> you can't say, sorry, sprint over, let's go back and start again. Wherever you are is wherever you are. Yeah? Now, the reality is, in our relationships with users, it's the same way. People make decisions based on the entrained patterns of past experience. It doesn't matter how rational or logical you are, whatever you say will be filtered through the last experiences, and that's reality. So understanding that we always co-evolve from the present, we, can't, we never get a greenfield sight, is also an important concept. And then we come to complexity, and normally it's portrayed as this, this kind of like, this is the opposite. You either have order or you have chaos. Uh, we've had more fascist governments and more draconian CEOs justify their position as the only alternative to chaos than I care to think of in the history of humanity. But the reality is there is a third type of system, a complex adaptive system. It is neither chaotic nor is it ordered. But the key thing to understand about it is you have to absorb it, you can't eliminate it. Now I'll explain why in a minute. But complexity has to be accepted, you have to live with the flow. It's kind of like you're managing a turbulent, fast-flowing stream and actually that is a matter of guiding or directing flow. It's about managing turbulence. It's not about structure and order. And actually most human systems fall into this category. And again, it's the problem with manufacturing models because the level of constraint required to make a manufacturing process work is far too high to something with a high level of uncertainty. And that's a key point to get across. So to define it, and everybody needs to define these things, key language. I'm going to define a system as any network with coherence. Now, again, a quote from Melissa Gerrara, who's one of the best thinkers in this field. She says, meaning exists in the gaps between people, not in the people themselves. I actually, it's the interactions between people which count, not the people. There's actually a very important conceptual shift. It's in <coughs> politics, it's a shift between atomism and commutarianism. So for those of you who don't know your political philosophy, atomism is a belief that society is assemblies of individual interests. Commutarianism says individuals only have meaning because of their membership of the society. Now from a cognitive science point of view, commutarianism is winning. Yeah, in terms of the base science of how we grow up and how we interact. That means relationships between people and things are not more important than the things themselves. Now, and again, we tend to focus on changing individuals rather than changing the way that people interact with each other. The latter is actually more successful. If you try and change every person, it's too hard. If you change the systems within their work, people change much faster. Right? So focus on that concept of networks and coherence. It's, the, it's one of the big new things, all right, is managing networks, which means managing these vague gaps between things is far more important than anything else. And you get all sorts of concepts there. You'll come across them like loosely coupled systems and so on.
The second thing is an agent. Now, an agent is anything which acts within or within the system. It's important to realize that agents in human systems are rarely individuals. Again, you know that somebody is terribly naive in this field if they start to talk about agents as people. The reality is agents in systems are coherent groups of people, interests, myths, or common stories. In fact, it's interesting the myths have higher agency in human systems than individuals. Now, I'll give you an example of that, my favorite one. I went to university in Britain in the 1970s. If you went to university in Britain in the 1970s, the issue wasn't whether you were on the left or right politically, but what type of Marxist were you and had you occupied the university yet this year? <laughs> yeah, we all went on to work for the intelligence agencies and IBM, but this was the 70s. Right? Um, I was leader of the Catholic Marxist-Leninist group. Uh, nobody stood a chance against us. We had political and religious discipline. We controlled campus for seven years. In my final year, we occupied the university for three months. We were finally dragged out by the police. Uh, 25 of us were expelled. We became known as the Lancaster 25. In the 70s, to be a name and a number was the highest status you could have. <laughs> and then we were reinstated by the Queen in Privy Council, with the university being judged guilty of a major breach of natural justice. I learned a huge amount of jurisprudence that year but I learned it in the courts of the UK rather than in the classroom. <laughs> On the basis of that, and going backwards and across, forwards across the wall in East Berlin, which includes an interesting two-night experience with the Stasi in the later part of the 70s, I can still distinguish between 15 types of Marxists based on a five-minute conversation in a bar late at night. <laughs> but I spent an awful lot of my time doing that. I now work in Washington for people, if you told me I was going to work for them in the 70s, and I've had myself taken out and shot for the sake of the revolution. <laughs> they think Tony Blair, who you might remember, is a left winger, which I find a strange concept. <laughs> they can distinguish between 15 different varieties of the neoconservative religious right, which for me is an amorphous mess, which justifies the full imposition of the Inquisition with all of its tools and instruments. Now, there's no genetic difference between us. The difference is the entrained patterns of the stories in the societies in which we grew up. And stories are fractal. They're self-similar. Companies, work groups, cultures. You actually can't escape the weaving pattern of the stories of the group with which you are in. It's actually quite interesting. We've done a lot of work on cultural mapping of companies. Within two to three months of joining a major company with a strong culture, people are telling stories which are similar to the stories of the people who've been there for 20 years. Yeah? We're narrative-based creatures and we like to conform. It's that interaction thing again. So understand that agents in a complex system, it's not this simple thing about everybody's an agent. Actually, agency is far more complex in its own right. That allows me to define three types of system. An ordered system is one in which the level of constraint is such that agent behavior is fully controlled. Now, one of the unique things about human beings is we've learned how to make this happen. If anybody tells you anything involving human being is complex, again, they don't understand the subject. One of the things, because we have intelligence, is we can put process controls in place which impose order. And it's a good thing to do. You know, counting the instruments in and out of an operating theatre so that they aren't left in your body after an operation sounds to me like a good application of order. And shouldn't be discouraged by people who think complexity is allowing anybody to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and hoping in self-order patterns from it. All right? um, the same is true on a whole body of software testing, you know, error proofing. I've done, I've done architectural design on airport management systems. Yeah, you need order at the testing phase on that. Otherwise, you've got problems. No? So there's nothing wrong with order. Uniquely, human beings have learned how to create it. And it's actually unique to us as a species. No? But it involves high levels of constraint. If you impose excessive constraint where the system won't support it, what actually happens is things go underground. When I was in IBM, we actually discovered that there was a direct correlation between the level of perceived bureaucracy in an organization and the density of the informal networks.
So the more bureaucratic an organisation got, the denser the informal networks became, because in order to make anything happen, you had to know somebody who could make it happen. And the most critical thing in IBM, which is the most bureaucratic company on the known universe, having worked for it for seven years, and makes the US government feel like it's dynamic and non-bureaucratic, <laughs> the first question you ever asked anybody is, who do you know? Because you needed to know which networks were people were in, because that was a survival mechanism. And if you were in the right networks, things happened. If you weren't, they didn't. Right? Now, the trouble with that sort of system is, is people are disguised in failure. Human beings don't like things to go wrong. We're actually quite nice people, ultimately, if we're in direct contact. So we make the system work, even though the rules don't allow it to, which means we disguise failure. So when failure comes, it's catastrophic because the tension in the system is built up where you get a disruptive, massive change. Right? So order has value provided the system can sustain it. It's dangerous otherwise. You then get a chaotic system. Now here it's open, so different people use chaos in different ways. I'm using it in the context of randomness. So basically, and there are two or three accepted ways this is one of them. A chaotic system is one in which there are no constraints, which means every agent of whatever nature is independent of every other nature. So that actually has huge value. If anybody knows the wisdom of crowds literature, people come across that concept? Okay, so you know, if, if you get... Well, the one I like best is the American submarine. So an American submarine grounds off the coast of Portugal. Uh, it didn't sink. I was corrected on that by an admiral in Norfolk Navy base. He pointed out that submarines are meant to sink. And I learned from that that if anybody has three stars on their shoulder, let them humiliate you in the first three minutes because it's out of their system and then they may listen to you thereafter. <laughs> so either way, if it goes down and it can't come up again, it's called grounding. So they got groups of marine experts around the world to estimate where it was but didn't allow any interaction. None of them got it right, but the average of all of them was six metres away from the submarine. Now, there are actually sound cognitive science and statistical reasons why that works. But to create a chaotic system, I to stop people interacting is really difficult. Yeah? We now do work on what is called human sensor networks, using whole of population or whole of workforce to actually make statistical decisions in isolation from each other as a way of doing augmented decision support. And I'll come back to that later because that's a powerful method to doing software development. But to actually create a system in which nobody can interact with anybody else is actually very difficult. So people who try and say chaos exists, and you know, we're getting a lot of this at the moment. You know, people are saying, my method is complex, your method is complicated. Yeah? And then the real extreme ones, well, I'm a chaos worker, yeah? uh, which means I'm a magician, to quote one of the idiots, all right? because I can manage chaos. All right? Now, this again indicates stupidity um, or intelligence with deception involved, which are the same thing. <laughs> Because fundamentally, in a chaotic system, order happens very, very quickly. To sustain chaos requires a huge amount of effort because you have to keep things separate. But if you can, it's useful. Again, you see the theory in form practice here? You need to understand the theory so you can apply it. So things like prediction markets, for example, are not examples of wisdom of crowds because in a market, everybody interacts with the other market movers so they know what's happening. So that influences their, their decision. Okay? So chaotic systems have value, but they're difficult to create. And then finally, we had a complex adaptive system. This is where the constraints and the agents are co-evolving. That concept again? The constraints are loose, but they get modified. The agents are modified by the constraints. As patterns form, they stabilize. You can never go backwards. Again, the teenage children point is made there. You can't go backwards and start again in a complex system. You're always dealing from the current stability or the current instability. Now, there are two metaphors to explain this, because what comes from this is a key phrase, ontology should precede epistemology. I'm doing this partly because I want to rescue the word ontology from the IT community who have fundamentally corrupted it from its original philosophical meaning. Uh, what the IT community means by, by ontology is actually taxonomy, but that word was too associated with taxidermy in English. Yeah, so they decided to borrow a word from philosophy and you misuse it. I use it in the philosophical sense, which is the fundamental nature of things. 
Right? So there are three basic ontologies, order, complex, and chaos. They have different causality, in fact, non-causality and complexity, so they're ontologies. Epistemology, the way we know things and the way we act, follows ontology. So if we've got an ordered system, we can know things in a certain way and we can act in a certain way. If it's a complex system, we know things in a different way and we have to act in a different way. Now this is a really revolutionary concept. In all management theory to date, people have gone down a single ontology route. The assumption is there's one right way of doing things and Agile has been no exception to that. Yeah? But actually, the modern way of thinking is to say, actually, there are three basic ontologies and add human perception, it goes up to five. That's Kinevin. But fundamentally, you behave differently in the different spaces. So something which works in a complex space won't work in an ordered space and vice versa. Now, I say, there are two metaphors I use to explain this. One is to think about managing a party for a bunch of children. Can everybody imagine a party for a bunch of nine-year-olds? Anybody managed one recently? Yeah, okay. Yeah, management may not be the right word, all right, but you know what I mean. Okay, so let's go through the three different types of system. If you assume the party is chaotic, then it means the children's behavior is completely random, which means they'll prob probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about that? I have friends in California who've tried this, but never more than once. The recovery cost is very high. <laughs> On the other hand, if the system is ordered, this will be more familiar to you. Yeah, the first thing you have to agree is clearly articulated learning objectives for the party. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong and should be printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds. And they should be placed around the room where you're going to hold the party. You should then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones yeah, against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. And the senior adult should start the party with a motivational videotape. <laughs> you don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives <laughs> and show the children how their allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If for any remote reason at the end of this the children aren't happy, then you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories <laughs> so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated, they'll like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party <laughs> management? The complex systems approach, on the other hand, is much simpler. In fact, we sometimes call complexity the new simplicity. We start off by drawing a line in the sand. This is known as a boundary. We look the children in the eye and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries because rigid boundaries tend to become brittle and break catastrophically. We then, and I'm deliberately introducing the language now, then we introduce catalytic probes. A football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, in the hope that a pattern of play, which is called an attractor, will form. If it's a beneficial one, we give it energy, we amplify it. If it's a negative one, we dampen it, we try and destroy it. So what we manage is the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And that is the fundamental principle of complexity theory applied to organizations or software development. You manage the boundary conditions, you manage the probes, you manage the emergence of beneficial coherence. It is an evolutionary process which takes far less resources than the ordered approaches that I satirized earlier but produces more beneficial outcomes 
but not outcomes you can know in advance. To make one other big distinction, some people think complexity theory is a subset of systems thinking. It isn't. It's radically different. All systems thinking methods in their popular manifestation and in their original theory assume that you can define an ideal future state and then they engineer to close the gap. Even at the soft, new age, fluffy bunny end of Peter Senge and the learning organization, you still define the values that you want everybody to have. You're defining an end state and closing the gap. And you see this a lot in organizational change and actually agile people. They define the ideal person and say, if everybody was like this, wouldn't life be wonderful? Well, the reality is nobody in the military would ever take that seriously and look at military models of organization. They cope with whatever comes in. And that's what we need to be coping with with the whole agile community is not developing methods based on an ideal person or ideal future state, but develop methods and tools which deal with day-to-day -day reality. Right? Complexity focuses on describing the present, identifying what you can change. Out of the set of things that you can change, where can you monitor the impact of that change? Because you don't change if you can't monitor. And out of the subset of the things that I can monitor, where might it produce a beneficial result? Or if it doesn't, we can learn from it. So it's a much more economical approach which starts from the the, the phrase I use, we manage the evolutionary potential of the present, which means we discover more sustainable and resilient futures, which we couldn't have anticipated, and actually trying to anticipate would have made things worse rather than better. So complexity is a different way of thinking. Um, the other metaphor I use, I'll come back to in a minute, but just to give another illustration. Anybody ever driven around this? It's 12 miles north of where I live. Uh, we call it the magic roundabout. <laughs> it's a reference to a children's television story from the 60s and 70s. Uh, that's what it looks like. <laughs> now, the roundabout is actually quite simple. Right? This is a civilized country, so you have to drive on the left. <laughs> it isn't Italy, so you don't cross the white lines. If you don't know it, Italian drivers actually have been studied and they operate on the same flocking behavior as birds do. Birds fly to the center of the flock, max speed, avoid collision. The minute you go to Naples or the south, it's, you know, max speed, avoid collision. It's the same principle, right? Literally, it's been studied. It's a flocking behavior, right? Once you learn that, it's okay. I've driven the Olfini coast. I know about flocking, right? Um, either way, the point about this is I can go around the roundabout in many different ways. And you may not know, but around that roundabout, as you can see, there's a football ground, Intel's European headquarters, three buildings, Bank Building Society, Financial Institution headquarters, a major shopping mall, the North Wiltshire Regional Hospital, and a major road exit. It never, ever jams up. It has the highest flow-through rate of any traffic junction in Europe and the lowest accident rate. Because actually, it has boundaries, but it allows emergent behavior. So as a driver drives into the roundabout, they can choose which way they go based on traffic flow, which means you've distributed a large amount of the cognitive process to the drivers themselves. They also slow down when they come into it, and they pay a lot of attention. <laughs> Creating systems where people slow down and pay attention actually turns out from a cognitive science point of view to be absolutely critical. We don't do this enough in software. We don't, I mean, we're building systems now for hospitals, which actually don't try and anticipate who shouldn't be discharged but trigger humans to a heightened state of alert when there's the potential for somebody not to be discharged. Get the principle? Human beings are very good if you trigger them at behaving in an adaptive way, but if you don't trigger them to a heightened state of alert, they just carry on doing things in a normal way. Now, that influences screen design and everything else. Of course, you could go for an engineering approach and centralize the cognitive process. Now, before you get too scared, there is actually a sculpture in East London. But I've seen road junctions up the Hudson Valley, which exactly match that. And, of course, the minute you put traffic lights in place, what actually happens is queuing theory means you get bunching. And also, if the traffic lights break down, nobody can cope. And the way they built that roundabout, if we go back to that picture, 
is it used to look like the signpost, but then they removed all the markings and they moved mobile barriers around for two years, filming the traffic per flow, until they created an optimal model. Cost of construction, very little. Cost of maintenance, very little. Ability to rapidly adapt to change in circumstances, very high. It's the equivalent, and I keep saying this, we need to stop designing applications and design architectures with objects in which applications emerge from the interaction of objects with people within architectures. That's exactly the same principle as the roundabout, is architecting to allow for emergence, which is one of the big changes we need to focus on. So that's a key thing. The other characteristics, run through them quickly. Complex adaptive systems are highly sensitive to small changes. And the trouble is they can differ each time. Yeah? Here's my other metaphor here. Imagine you've got a round table, and around the table there are electromagnets, and in the middle of the table there are iron ball bearings. Now, for the pedants amongst you, the table has a high coefficient of resistance. All right? I just want to get that out of the way before anybody objects. If I change one of the magnets, the iron ball bearing pattern changes in a predictable and repeatable way. In systems thinking, the magnet is called a driver. What everybody wants to know is, what are the drivers? If I change this, what result will it produce? You see this in the Agile literature as well. The reality of it's a complex adaptive system, you've got lots of magnets. And actually, they're all changing at the same time. So you change this magnet this time, and it produces that effect. The next time you change it, it produces a completely different effect. And the magnets in complexity theory are called modulators. So a complex adaptive system is modulated, it's not driven. Which actually, another point about managing emergence, it's a different way of thinking about things. Small things produce radically different effects. You don't get repeatability. That means that a complex adaptive system isn't causal in the conventional sense of the word. It's dispositional. You actually don't get repetition except by accident, but you can measure the dispositions of the system to evolve in different directions and I'll talk about how we do that later. But that is a big switch. Yeah. Secondly, hindsight doesn't lead to foresight. Uh, the technical word for this is retrospective coherence. The fact that it worked that way in the past doesn't mean it will work that way in the future. But people constantly do this. Uh, if anybody's read the Congressional Report on 9-11? Yeah, anybody read it? Okay, well, it's worth reading. I mean, there's some wonderful stories in it. Uh, but fundamentally, after it's all happened, everybody can see what everybody else should have done. Yeah, and that's always the case when anybody does a project assessment. But funnily enough, we keep getting them wrong, don't we? Uh, the reason is they're complex adaptive systems and they're constantly shifting or changing. In fact, the more you actually prevent past failure, the more you increase the probability of future failure. doesn't mean you don't learn lessons, but you don't learn lessons in a rigid way based on an understanding of the past. It's a different process. We tend to talk about lessons learning rather than lessons learned. You need real-time active feedback mechanisms from multiple human sensors because that gives you control. And it's got to be real-time. It can't be process-based. Proximity is key. Again, anybody got teenage children? Did I check on that earlier? OK, well, I'm going to give you a gift, all right? Um, they may already, but if not, they will. Come back one day at 4 o'clock in the morning. Your first reaction is to hug them because they're alive. <laughs> Your second reaction is to kill little bastards because they kept you up in a state of panic and worry. And then they come up with this wonderful story involving mobile phone reception and having to look after a friend. Any, yeah, okay, there's a few nods around the room. Uh, if they do this, get them to tell the story backwards. It's almost impossible for a human being to lie backwards consistently. <laughs> There are many advantages working with the intelligence agencies. One is you learn these things. Right? <laughs> Any human being can lie forwards, but lying backwards is actually hard. We actually have a body of methods on lessons learned which force people to step through a project backwards rather than step through it forwards. A technique called Future Backwards you can load down from the website. Because stepping backwards increases the cognitive load on the brain so it remembers more. Whereas stepping forwards, people just go into patterns based on what they want the result to be. Yeah? So be aware of that, because then coming back to the teenagers, the thing you most worry when they hit puberty is who their friends are. Because now they're interacting with people other than you, and those friends will fundamentally influence who they are.
Right? So who people are approximate to is actually a key control mechanism in a complex adaptive system. You can only manage a certain amount of things, but proximity and interaction is one of the things you manage. Yeah? Again, not outcome, you're managing, managing interaction. Uh, confusing correlation with causation and simulation with prediction. Uh, both of these are big dangers. You know, the fact that 100 companies have got successful CEOs, yeah? this is the classic model. You know, we study 100 companies, we identify what they do, and we say, do that, you'll get the same result. Okay? Well, the fact that 100 agile teams have had actually had a project manager who has regular bowel movements doesn't mean that if you recruit your project managers on the basis of their toilet habits that you will be guaranteed successful projects. Now, okay, regular bowel movements are associated with lack of stress, so there may be some linkage, but it's not a causal link. And again, you see a huge amount of this, the confusion of correlation with causation, which doesn't take context into account. But now in a modern world, we've got the confusion of simulation with prediction. I can simulate all sorts of things in software, for example, birds flocking, but I can't predict whether they'll go to the left or the right of the mountain, and that can be significant. Right? So this the desire for determinancy is common and dangerous. And also, you need to keep your options open. I mean, Chris talks about this a lot, you know, on option theory. But fundamentally, premature convergence is the main danger of complexity. Converging too quickly on a solution, not keeping multiple possibilities open. And I'll talk more about how to do that in a minute. So, the practice point again. So now coming on to frameworks. Um, we need to start thinking in terms of scaffolding um, for this. The whole point about scaffolding is that it provides support while a structure is being built, but then the structure should self-sustain it when the scaffolding is removed. Right? So any sense-making framework really needs to pass the scaffolding test. It's there to create something which then is contextualized and sustains itself without necessarily the original scaffolding surviving. I've also shown bamboo scaffolding, if anybody's been to Hong Kong or Singapore. Skyscrapers are built with people stringing together bamboo rather than metal rods, and it's actually a damn sight more flexible, it's more organic, right? So I kind of like to take the metaphor across from that. Second thing is, models are very restricted in human systems. Um, models are useful, provided you don't think they represent reality. Uh, to quote Murray Gell-Mann, the only valid model of a human system is the system itself. Okay? So you've got to be very, very careful on how you use models. And finally, if you can't draw a model on the back of a table napkin from memory, it has no utility. Uh, it's that simple. The whole point about a sense-making framework is you can make sense of it, which means you've got to be able to draw it quickly, and Kinevin does that, the minute you go beyond that with multiple matrices and multiple interactions, forget it. Right? You created something which has utility to the creator, but no utility for a general population. So think of what I'm going to talk about in terms of scaffolding. I'll go through this fairly quickly because I want to come to some other stuff. Kinevin basically takes those three systems, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems, but it breaks order into two, simple and complicated. Uh, the reason for making that distinction is in a simple ordered system, you know, both of them are causal, both of them the same thing will happen again the same way twice. In both cases, there is a right solution which you can discover. In the first case, it's self-evident to any reasonable person, so you can impose best practice. And the model is sense, categorize, respond. What's happening? What does it fit? Right, we do this. Yeah, standard operating procedures, all those sort of cool things. On the other hand, if it's complicated, it's not self-evident, so we have to go through some analysis process or bring in trusted experts to assess the situation. So we sense, analyze, respond. That means we apply good practice. We can't impose one solution. We've got to allow some variation if people have expertise. A big mistake people make is to impose one way of doing things when people with real expertise know there are subtle variations and the issue is how they're allowed to do it. So those are kind of like the two order domains. Complex, a children's party story. Yeah, you can only understand it by interacting with it. You probe in order to find out what's possible. And I'll go through a method for that in a minute. And finally, chaos, which is not a domain like the others. It's a transitionary state. It's difficult to maintain. If you're in it, you take action. Yeah, very simple. Now, Kinevin has two other aspects which a lot of people neglect. 
Uh, people draw it as a two by two matrix because they're familiar. Sometimes they draw it as that and put a circle in the middle, but that kind of like misses the point, right? Um, it's actually drawn as a sweep of the pen like that. It's very fast and it's done that way deliberately. Disorder is a state of not knowing which of the systems you're in. It's not the same thing as chaos because actually you are in one of the systems, you just don't know what it is. And that's a dangerous place because you'll behave according to which system you're most happy with. And that's actually a bad thing. It's also a transitionary space. And finally, the bottom bit, uh, the reason we put simple next to chaos, remember I talked about catastrophic failure if you overconstrain a system? That's that break. You overconstrain the system, it looks lovely, simple, ordered and tidy, then one day, bang, it's gone over. And we've all got examples of that if you've been around for a few years. So that's Kenevin. It's fully described in that article. Uh, Joseph Praling's also written an article on the context of Agile. Uh, you can either buy that from Harvard or you can search for the name on the web. I leave it to your conscience, which you actually choose. Um, the article has high utility, by the way, if you're trying to persuade people to take complexity seriously. Um, it was the cover article on the Harvard Business Review in 2007, November 2007. You don't get many cover articles in the Harvard Business Review. It won the Academy of Management Award as the best practitioner paper that year. And last year it won another one as the 50 most cited papers in management science. All right, so this is not some novel, new, wild idea. This is a well-established, well-researched principle. Kenevin has a huge amount of both academic and practitioner citations behind it as well. And actually that's important if you're going to get people to buy into something. You need that sort of pedigree. The other thing people forget is Kenevin is actually about movement, not about categorization. It's amazing how people say they just want to put things into the boxes. Now the reality is Scrum done properly is a complex, complicated transition. Yeah? Really effective methods are about moving things between the domains. They're not in the domains. And there's no inherent goodness or badness about any of the domains. All of them are equally good or equally bad in context. Yeah? So if your method is good because it's complex and somebody else's method is bad because it's complicated, again, you ain't got it. Yeah? Fundamentally, the main driver on Kenevin is to move between those two. You relax the constraints so new possibilities emerge. As the possibilities prove themselves, you increase the constraints so you can exploit the result. So you move from exploration to exploitation, relaxing and then increasing the constraint. And that's the dynamic you want to maintain. And again, that's what the Agile principles are about, but people often just try and move things across too quickly. If you need to do a reset, you may need to do a shallow dive into chaos, which is a radical reduction of, of constraints. And we teach about how to do that on the courses, you know, but that's a, a, a reset model, it's not a normal model. And of course, a small amount of stuff goes down there. Now, the idea is you only put stuff there when you want it to die. Now, it may take 50 years to die, and it may have a lot of utility, but it ain't going to change. So you only move things into simple. You only move out of that dynamic when you know the thing is now so static, it's not going to change over time. Right? So the vast majority of what we do in software development is actually up in the complex, complicated domain. If you want to know the metaphor, by the way, Paul Killiers, when he was alive, had a wonderful one for this. He said, an aircraft is complicated, a mayonnaise is complex. Now, if you start to think about that, you'll see some of the differences between them. And if you want the recent Gartner report, um, that just came out recently. Um, I, did, we, I asked the editor, why did you say just operations? And he said, well, I was only asked to write a report about operations, but probably everything. Now, again, that's credibility. If you want to adopt complexity, those sort of things give you credibility with senior management. Right? So I share them for that purpose. Okay, let's move on to the complex domain itself. I should say, by the way, that if you're from Wales, dragons are the good guys and knights with swords are the bad English guys, all right? Dragons are our national symbol, so we're on the side of the dragons, all right? Um, the sort of hold a meeting mentality, or worse still, I mean, if there was an agile version of this, it would be quick somebody hold an open space. <laughs> because then we can all have a nice time and nobody will be challenged. Just to make a controversial statement, open space is the enemy of innovation because it enforces consensus. Yeah? There are actually larger group techniques, certainly which we and others have developed, which actually increase conflict, because if you don't increase conflict, you don't get diversity and you don't get proper testing. So the law of two feet is the enemy of innovation 
because it allows people to avoid confrontation where they need to do confrontation. It right? doesn't mean it doesn't have value, but it's a contextual method. So the complex domain, one of the things I've done recently, if you look on the blog, you'll see these are all changing at the moment yeah? um, because we had a big session in uh, Seattle um, recently with a lot of practitioners. But being as complexity is starting to take off, I'm now producing some more conventional frameworks. So this is a three by three. So this is a further level down from, from complexity, or it's an entry level for somebody who just wants to introduce something conventional. And this looks at two things. It looks at the degree of consensus. So in the bottom, that starts off with a very small group of people, the inner circle, the cognoscenti, understand this. Then it moves up to orthodoxy. Most people accept this. Up to what's called synchrony. That's a reference to the resilience literature. Everybody's marching in step. Now, everybody got that? The horizontal domain looks at the level of proof, which starts off with gut feel. Nobody's got any proof whatsoever, but some good people think it's a good thing to do. Nothing wrong with that. Most good ideas start that way, but realize where it is. Moving through, it's inductive, it's case-based. We've got evidence it will work, but it's not absolute proof. Up to actually, it's beyond reasonable doubt. Right? So you, we've got a proof level there. Now, the line which goes through the middle, effectively in complex, goes from chaos to complexity. That's called the line of coherence. It says if we're on that line, it's okay. Because we really don't want to have excessive proof, but not have buy-in. If we do that, we get heretics and mavericks. So this is where a small group of people know they're right, but nobody else believes them. And their solution to this problem is to explain to people why they're right, and when that doesn't work, they explain to the people why they're wrong. And then they wonder why they get taken out into the village square, tied to a large wooden pole, people arrive with brushwood and flaming torches, and they suffer the fate of all heretics. <coughs> Um, there are actually two strategies. Um, you need heretics in an organization because they think differently. There are two strategies from a management perspective if you get this. One is coaching. This is finding people who can interpret them to the wider community. What you're doing is pulling them back onto the coherence line. And actually one of the big roles of coaches is to do this, is to reinterpret material because the people with the bright new ideas are very poor at explaining them in the main. So creating interpreters, this is one of the roles, for instance, for retired people. People just leaving the company have got the networks, the credibility, they're no longer trying to build power. It's, we're now talking about a phased transition out of work into retirement, and actually mentor mediation roles for innovation is one of the key roles for people at that point. The other alternative, which is used a lot in software, and I've been in a few of these in my time, are basically hide it until it can prove itself. Um, and transparency, again, is the enemy of innovation. If you make everything transparent, nobody takes risks. Yeah, you actually need your senior managers to have discretionary overspending because then they can take some risks. If everything they do is visible, they won't take risks, and that strategy isn't available. The other kind of like coaching strategy is if you've actually only got case-based reasoning, you kind of like moved up too fast. If everybody's in step, you haven't got questioning, so you need to create some challenges there. Again, this is a management process. The dangerous one is that. That's where everybody's in step. Yeah? Everybody's in agreement, but there's no evidence for it. People who still think Microsoft has got decent operating system software and people should use PowerPoint actually fall into this category fairly clearly. Um, yeah, there's no actual evidence to support what they're saying. In fact, the evidence is the other way around, but it's orthodoxy. I mean, you'd be amazed how often this happens. Yeah, people just fall into step. And fundamentally, that needs to be broken up because you want to be on this line. This is where I really want to make the strong point. Most projects start there. I've yet to see a single example of a sprint which didn't start there. It waits until there's enough agreement this is the right thing to do and enough evidence it's the right thing to do before it gets started. In fact, the whole process of Scrum with a definition of a project user who defines the requirement at the start Notice, by the way, that we still don't engage users. I mean, IT people don't like users. And we all know that, all right? You know, users don't know what they want until they get it, then they want something different. Um, there are more user jokes in the IT community than there are jokes about Irishmen in England, all right, and so on. Um, so actually, even in Scrum, we make the users sit at the start of the process and come in at the end so we can keep them away from the programmers. I'm going to argue in a minute that's actually bloody dangerous, all right? And you actually want the real users in interaction with the programmers through their narratives, not a representative of the users. Yeah, that's actually also dangerous. 
So we need to do something before that, because just moving from there to there does work, but what we're missing is that. That actual phase where there are far more possibilities, where we need to do far more experimentation, this is a true complex space, before we move things into the more conventional processes, and sorry about this, but Scrum is now a conventional process. Nothing wrong with that, it's good it's reached out maturity, but we need something which we're starting to call pre-Scrum. Yeah? I thought about talking about mini-rugby, but decided that wouldn't re work really as a metaphor. Yeah? Now there are two things there which I want to run through very quickly in my remaining time. One is called, and I still haven't got the right name for this, but it's working multiple parallel experiments. What's interesting, if you look at it, a sprint is still sequential. It keeps running the same line in multiple iterations till so it gets it right. That's sequential, it's not parallel. Yeah, parallelism is very different. You run multiple things in parallel, and I'll go through the rules for that in a minute. And then before that and throughout it is this concept of micro-narrative, again, which I'll explain briefly. So going on to safe-to-fail interventions, what you do in this space, if you've got a half-formed idea about what you want to do, instead of deciding one approach, any coherent theory gets to run a safe-to-fail experiment. And the rules for that are very simple. It has to be coherent. Not just any experiment goes. You have to be able to make a case for it that people can realize. Interestingly, this is a conflict resolution device. To agree that your idea is coherent is not to agree it's right. I can say I disagree with you, but you've got an argument. Now, and this is one of the ways we radically reduce conflict, because you're not required to agree it's right, you're just required to agree it's coherent. If it's coherent, it gets to run an experiment. It needs to be safe to fail. Nobody runs an experiment unless they actually know in advance what they'll do if it starts to fail. It needs to be small, tangible, short term. Again, a key principle of complexity. And for the portfolio overall, we need some which are oblique. A wonderful book by a British economist called Obliquity. We often solve problems by trying to solve related problems. So one of your experiments should be solving a related problem, not the problem itself. Only one, but you're going to run at least seven. Some need to be naive. I've deployed anthropologists into hotel chains to discover authority manuals. I haven't sent in anthropologists who've studied industry. I've taken them directly from the jungles of Papua New Guinea on their PhD programs. Uh, the paper they wrote on mating rituals in the kitchen was actually fascinating. Um, but the one they wrote on authority confrontations in reception transformed the way we manage that hotel. Yeah? So you're bringing somebody with deep knowledge but naive about the problem to look at it sideways. So one experiment should be naive. Yeah? This is scaffolding. Think about this. We're creating some scaffolding. You build your own structure within it. If you've got a portfolio of projects, you're going to have some high-risk, high-return ones, which you wouldn't be allowed on their own right. And fundamentally, you need contradiction. If one experiment succeeds, another should fail. Because what you actually now do is you run seven, three, three, minimum of three, maximum of seven, safe to fail experiments, which could be sprints, but could be something much more flexible, doing a whole body of work in the States at the moment on this principle, to actually see what's possible before you move it into that middle, middle quadrant of complexity. So that's one method. And there's forms to control it, which have some metaphors. So this is... That's kind of like complicated, this is complex. What's the action? Why is it coherent? What are the signs of success? What are the signs of failure? How will you amplify it? How will you dampen it? If you can't fill those in, it's not a safe-to-fail experiment. So again, you put in some control mechanism. Again, you can download those from our website. Finally, this concept of narrative. Anybody filled out an employee satisfaction survey? Come on, somebody's filled out an employee satisfaction survey. Right. We used to get this all the time in IBM. You get this survey and it would say, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? Everybody familiar with this? Well, I got it and I phoned up personnel and I got straight through. I had a reputation with personnel because I just completed a project which showed that astrology was more effective than Myers-Briggs in predicting team behavior. We've run a proper controlled experiment over six months. I proved my point, um, but the paper was suppressed. Right? because they didn't like it. Right? Um, but never mind, that's a story for another day. Either way, I got straight through to the head of HR, because what the hell is he up to this time? And I said, how am I meant to fill this out? Because I've got several managers. Sometimes they consult me, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they should, and sometimes they shouldn't. 
And she said, average your experience over the whole year. And I said, you guys don't understand research. We actually take a different approach. So we take a sample of the population every week, every month, and we say, what's the story you tell your best friend if they were off the job in the company about your company? And then we say, index the story, and this is a triangle from that, is management behavior, where does it sit between altruistic, assertive, or analytical? Now, balancing between three things activates the novelty receptive aspect of the brain. Putting things on a linear scale, you just tag it where you want to tag it. You don't think much. Now, again, there's some strong cognitive science behind this. You're forcing people to weight three factors, requires them to think more. It's more of a game. It's gamification. Therefore, they do it. And that gives me a large amount of quantifiable data. So basically, it's the micro-narratives of the water cooler which determine what people think. It's not stories told in workshops, and for God's sake, it's not use cases. Use cases are over-structured, over-constrained, over-idealized. Yet they're not the same as the reality of the stories people talk about around the water cooler, frustrated in front of a terminal. Those are the stories you want, not the artificial stories constructed in a workshop, and particularly the ones rewritten by systems analysts as part of a requirement spec. We all know requirement specs. Yeah, with entity models, they're designed so users sign things they can't understand, but we can hold them accountable for later. I mean, that's the whole function of requirement specs. Sorry, I've been around for a bit. I know this stuff, right? These also have a key concept in complexity, which is called necessary ambiguity. We actually patented this sort of method because it's a simple concept but of huge value. And finally, this is distributed ethnography. We can now actually, for example, in, in Mexico, no, in, in Colombia at the moment, We've got children all over the streets of six cities gathering stories from their parents about what's working or not working in the economy, indexing the stories as they go. So we've got real-time statistical feedback with the ability to look at the stories behind the statistics as explanatory power. This is my point about real-time feedback systems. This is a complex approach. So I'll give an example. This is a health one. People are actually recording a story, taking a picture, drawing something and loading it up, whatever they want to do. They're indexing it as they go, and then we can start to look at patterns in the indexing. Uses of that, I'm coming to a conclusion now because I'm running out of time. Cultural and attitude mapping. The stories that people tell, and we've done this across the world now, fundamentally reveal the culture of the organization and what's sustainable or not sustainable. Some cultures will sustain things that other cultures won't. So cultural mapping is like a pre-process, and the signifiers that we use for that, the triads, come from cultural anthropology. Yeah, so we can back that up with sound theory. Mapping directly onto the Kinevian framework. Yeah, we now don't have to do that in workshops. You can get a population to actually record their experiences on a day-to-day -day basis and compute where the systems lie on that framework. So you're moving into real-time monitoring again. And the big one is user requirements capture. What we start to do there is instead of sending our analysts to interview people, and if you don't know the basic facts on this, if somebody interviews more than two people, their brain forms a subconscious hypothesis and they only pay attention to things that match that hypothesis thereafter. And if they say their training prevents it, they probably formed a hypothesis before the first interview. <laughs> yeah? What we do is get a huge sample, of you, as many as you want of the users, to keep daily diaries in the apps. What frustrates them? What would they like different? What did they see on another system? Why doesn't the system do this as it happens? index very quickly onto those triads. Then when we get a cluster pattern in the indexes, then we develop software for that cluster as a prototype. Because we've got an evidence base, which is statistically provable, which says we've got this cluster of requirements. But critically, the programmer or developer can now work to the stories, not an analyst or an interpretation of those stories. They're working directly to the stories. That's called disintermediation. You're removing the mediating layers between the stories and the analyst. And you're also creating a measurement system, because if your software works, it should change the stories and change the way that people index them, so you've got a real-time rollout capability. Again, I'm trying to make it there are tools now which make complexity possible. Then we get into managed acceptation. So on the left-hand side of there, I have technology capabilities. Yeah, things that software does indexed by techies. On the right-hand side, I have user stories about things that frustrate them, things they want to do differently. Remember we talked about acceptation? 
Right, they're all indexed on those triads. I mash the databases together. And I get three types of cluster. Clusters of user stories with technologies, which means the human brain is now triggered to say, hang on a minute, why are those stories linked with those technologies? Ah, I've got it. That's managed acceptation. You're trying to throw things together in novel or different ways. The things the Apple designers do intuitively, but we haven't made into a process. You also get the other interesting ones, a group of user stories without any technology associated, or a group of technologies without any user stories. And of course, that can happen on a continuous basis. You start to see where we're going with this? You move into a much more continuous, real-time feedback mechanism with human sensors involved to allow the evolution of software. And that leads me to kind of like the end of this, which is a dispositional, not causal. These are called fitness landscapes. Um, they're three-dimensional models. That white grid that you see has got 60,000 self-indexed micro-narratives micro in it. The hollows represent stable patterns in those stories, which ain't going to change. The saddle points represent potential stabilities, which means if you want the saddle point to be deeper, you don't go to people and give an abstract instruction. You say, how would we get more stories told like this and fewer stories told like that? Think about that in software development. You go to developers, how would we get more stories like this and fewer stories like that? It's an instruction they can understand. Yeah, not some abstract set of principles from a manual. It's a real, real instruction. And it can be understood at all levels. The yellow dots, and this is critical in complexity, are outliers. You never eliminate outliers because that's where strategic surprise and strategic opportunity come from. So the representation allows you to do both. And that leads me to my penultimate slide, and the last one will be very quick. We need to realize that we're dealing with human beings, not machines. Anybody who says the human brain is like a computer doesn't understand cognitive science. Anybody who believes in the singularity, anybody come across the idea of the singularity? Well, if they got to the stage where they believe in the singularity, their brain is probably ossified to the fact where it could be transferred to a computer. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a model Gary Klein and I developed called the see attend act Whether I see the data, whether I pay attention to the data, whether I will, can act on the data are three separate processes. Put in the right information at the right time to the right people with the right training and the right competences does not mean they will make the right decisions. Whether you see it, whether you pay attention to it, whether you act on it are different, you need different processes for all of them. And you really need in this to avoid the people who are just jazzing up old methods with a new language. There are a huge amount of people who don't realize complexity is uncomfortable, it's difficult, but it has huge potential. Yeah, the minute you see somebody who's just taken the methods they've been using for the last 20 years and put the new language on it, just forget it. Right? Complexity is a radical, different way of thinking. It's the equivalent of systems thinking in the 80s, which transformed the way we think. Complexity is doing the same now. Thank you very much for your time. So nobody interrupted and I ran over time on that, so I don't know whether we can take questions or not. Yeah, any questions or is everybody desperate for coffee? <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Um, you, you told something about uh, all the experiments that, uh, that one should, should do in, in a company uh, to, to make good decisions. And, yeah. and see. Uh, do you see this as a, an economical approach? Yeah, very. If you look at the amount of time which goes into people deciding even to invest in software development or any strategic initiative, it's huge. So the key thing now for managers is much simpler. You say, okay, here's a situation. It's complicated. It's complex, right? It's complicated. Design a project, evidence-based. It's complex. Don't waste any more time. Who's got coherent theories? Half a day, right? Here's $5,000 each. Go and run an experiment. Yeah? It actually saves you a huge amount of money and time because you're actually using a method appropriate to the system. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Can you elaborate once again what you mean with coherent? It seems to be like the cornerstone to, to yeah. an example to. Well, for example, let, let's take that the statistical patterns I showed you on the stories. One of the reasons we developed that, this was originally counterterrorism, pre radicalization, but is now health and everything else. 
So one of the things we're working on at the moment is a system which will trigger doctors to a heightened state of alert if people on heart attack risk are about to be discharged prematurely from hospitals. Because in the States and the UK, the financial consequences for the hospital are huge if they do that. Yeah? <coughs> now, the way we're doing that is we're getting patients to keep patient journals throughout their hospital stay, and patients like doing that, including representing pain onto triads, etc., so we get really valuable data. We've got medical interns observing medical practitioners capturing data like that. Yeah? That means I can see statistical patterns in the stories, which I can then associate with examples of other people who have been discharged prematurely. So I'm not saying this person shouldn't be discharged. I'm saying the overall pattern of all of these small observations means that I should pay attention to this person in a different way. That's coherence. So once I get a statistical clutter in indexing of a mass participation, I've got an evidence-based argument. Right? And actually, it's quite interesting. This is evidence-based. Remember that gut feel section? Uh, one of the systems we built actually in Zurich, but I'm not to say for who, allows the board of a company to consult all of their workforce in real time during a board meeting. So if nobody knows what the problem is, the problem is broken into three different aspects, so nobody knows the real problem. <coughs> Distributed to panels of people who index it onto five triads in real time, the results come back graphically. So we can now start to use technology to augment decision-making under conditions of extreme uncertainty by using human networks, and that's using chaos constructively. Okay, I think I've got to finish now from the Thank approach. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks. So... Wir haben noch ein bisschen Zeit für eine ganz kurze Pause. Dankeschön.